It occurs to me that a 500 megaton bomb planted at just a proper point would, uh, would destroy most of California. Millions of innocent people would be killed. And the West Coast as we know it would fall into the sea. Bye-bye, California. <laughs> Hello, new West Coast, my West Coast. That's Superman Christopher Reeve listening to criminal Gene Hackman plot to destroy the state of California and Superman in the new $40 million spectacular movie. Superman is the biggest and one of the best holiday films we'll be looking at on sneak previews. Two critics talking about the new movies. And this is Roger Ebert, the Pulitzer Prize winning film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And across the aisle from me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune and CBS TV News in Chicago. You know, there's a tradition in the movie business that a lot of the biggest and best and most ambitious films open during the holiday season. Well, sometimes they live up to our expectations, and I think Superman certainly does, and sometimes, alas, they do not. We'll be reviewing five of this year's would-be blockbusters on this week's show, including the action thriller Force Tin from Navarone, John Travolta and Lily Tomlin as lovers in a terrible movie called Moment by Moment, the saga of an American gypsy family in King of the Gypsies, and the saga of the Man of Steel in Superman. And now Gene starts with Oliver's story. Well, Roger, as everyone probably remembers, Ali McGraw died of leukemia in Love Story, a smash hit film in 1970. Now, just because she died, that's no reason to kill off a chance to make some more money with a similar theme. And so we have Oliver's story, the sequel with a grief-stricken Ryan O'Neill. He was Ali McGraw's husband in the first film, trying to pull his life together. He's a socially committed lawyer now, and one day in the park he meets Candace Bergen. She's the heiress to the Bonwood Teller fortune, so good looks and big bucks. Ryan O'Neill may be socially committed, but he's no dummy. Anyway, on their third date, O'Neill finally spills the beans to Bergen about why he's so down in the dump psychologically, but first he refuses dessert. Boy, nice willpower. What about yours? Uh. You know, I'm good tonight in front of you. Then tomorrow I'll sneak off somewhere and eat ice cream and eclairs. That's the difference between us, you know. I'm self-indulgent and you're self-sacrificing. What do you mean? I don't know. It's just an impression that I get. You believe in rightness and fairness and high-minded things. I bet you didn't even tell lies when you were a kid. Oh, yes, I did. Sometimes I still do. What do you mean? Well, it wasn't a lie exactly, but I wasn't being completely honest with you last week. I mean, you you, uh, you seem to assume that I was divorced. You're separated? She's dead. How did... How old was she? She was 25. Leukemia. I'm, I'm really sorry, Oliver. I know this was not the right time to tell you, but I'm not a good liar, Marcy, and I couldn't let it go on like this. Oh, I know. It's okay. Boy, he really hams it up on that leukemia line. Anyway, they soon drift apart. O'Neill spends a lot of time going to a shrink. His visits to a psychologist are just as foolish as they always are in the movies. So much forced pain. Eventually, O'Neill makes it with Candace Bergen. It's a restrained scene in a motel room. These two pretty-faced actors aren't about to get naked physically or emotionally. When will I see you again? How about five seconds? 
Look at that sunset. How are you doing? Fine. But you feel a little guilty, right? Maybe. Because you thought about Jenny. Because I didn't. They seem more interested in themselves there. Maybe if they gave each one a mirror, they could, <laughs> they could play the scene with a little more emotion, you know? Let's face it, this is a lightweight soap opera. Just two pretty faces going through the motions. It's a soft, fuzzy, wuzzy romance. No real consideration of grief. Frankly, I never cared whether these people ever got together. I never felt these characters even existed. I always saw Ryan O'Neill acting, Candace Bergen acting. I saw them acting all the way trying to jerk tears out of my eyes as if they were using pliers. Listen, you didn't need any pliers on Ryan O'Neill. He went through the <laughs> entire picture on the verge of tears. You know, will I eat breakfast? I think I'll eat lunch. <laughs> Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? The guy is constantly on the edge of tears. It's amazing. Yeah. And she's been dead for years by this point. I mean, yeah. grief is one thing. Loss is one thing. But the movie is about rebuilding, and he takes so long to rebuild, he want to say, come on, Ryan, get off of it. <laughs> were you a necrophiliac? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, as I watch this, first of all, right at the beginning, you spot him as just acting. And second, the film only has one point, which is, Get over it. Well, they tell us that in the first reel and repeat it for the rest of the movie. And then it's even the closing line. You know, I must say, I did like Love Story, and this is at least a sincere remake. It's just a bad, sincere remake. Mm -hmm. I think we should move on to some characters who are a little more appealing, gypsies. <laughs> One thing about that everybody knows about gypsies is that not very much is known about gypsies, and that the gypsies like it that way. Now, King of the Gypsies is a very good, very highly flavored look at American gypsy life, and it's all the more absorbing because it really does seem to know and understand why the gypsies have survived and endured for so many centuries in so many countries. It's the story of three generations in a gypsy family and of how the power, the kingship, is passed from the old patriarch to his grandson. And to be the worthy grandson of a gypsy king, you have to start young as a con man. Here's one of the movie's best scenes as the little kid who will grow up to be king is taken into a jewelry store by his mother. Thank you, Mr. Talmud. At, uh, at 65, uh, at $65,000, this is a very fairly priced. The other, I would, uh, I would suggest having it recut before you bought it. Unless, of course, you like it because it's old-fashioned, in which case it's I, a good price. I don't know. Yeah. I... Ah, uh -huh. uh, would you like some, uh, some coffee? Do you have some Colombian or Viennese blend in a cafe filter? No, I'm afraid we have Maxwell House. Well, I could not drink it. Dave might have sit still. But I have to go to the airport. Oh, Dave, always at the wrong time. I can't help it. Dave. I want to drink a water. Oh, oh Dave, oh, all right. No I'll fair. I... You get whatever you want. Perhaps you could get him a co Just a minute. We'll, we'll leave in just a minute. I want to go Mr. Tommy, would you please fetch a glass of water? Thank you. Please, now, take it easy. You... No, 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 no. Come with Mama. No. Oh, 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 my goodness, Dave. Please, 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 please now. Darling, ah. he's very strong, no problem. Mr. Tomo. Oh, please. Uh, Davey, my dove, my sweetheart. Oh, don't get so excited. You're making the man very upset. Oh, oh Dave, Dave, don't get there. You mustn't. Oh, look, look, look what the nice man brought you. Oh, look, look, look. Ah, thank you very much. Here, that's it. Come this way. Very slowly, that's it. Slowly, slowly. Ah, that's good now. Remember what the doctor told us not to get so excited there. He's all right? Good. Uh, then we'll go home now. Don't worry. Mama can come back another day. Excuse Thank you me, so much. Uh, did you notice the solitaire huh? Perhaps it fell on the floor when you got up or was... Mm, no. Oh, my heavens, you mean it's not here? Are you no. sure? Have you gone through yes, all Yes, uh, thank you. The no, thank you very much. We'll do that. Thank you. But all right. Very well, then we'll go. Come on, my love. Uh, madame. Madame. Uh, you said your name was G Gomez Quinones. Quinone. Si. I'm afraid I have to ask you to stay until we can get some identification. You want what? It's too late. It's not easy being a gypsy kid. That was <laughs> Susan Sarandon as the mother. She gives one of the best performances in the film. And the star of the picture is a young actor who's kind of hot right now named Eric Roberts, who plays the grandson. Now, here they are again 15 years later. The boy is growing up now. He's broken away from the old gypsy ways, and in front of his wasp girlfriend, he attacks his mother for selling her 13-year-old daughter into a gypsy marriage. How much? Six thousand? Has he still got it? No. 
He blew it at the races, right? What a husband you got. You know, you're like Robin Hood. You steal from the rich and you give to the poor. Guapo! Only mama, when you steal from the rich, you go to jail. He goes to the track. You could fix this thing for Tita. What does that mean? What I come to tell you before we got off on all this, the old man is dying and he, he wants to see you. Davy, he's going to give the ring and the medallion to you. Oh, Jesus. The old man, he don't want to make your father the big man. Poor brother. Mama. See, what you don't understand is we live in a democracy. There are no kings. You can really see the power of Eric Roberts there. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to be the new Robert De Niro or uh, Al Pacino, we'll see, but he's certainly good in this one. Mm -hmm. And all the main characters give believable performances, performances that put this alien subject matter into human perspective. So King of the Gypsies lets us experience a whole world of people living in the past, the homes, the costumes, the customs of a society that has remained mysterious and close to most of us. I liked it too, strong performances, and you're right, it does take us to a private world, so we're sort of getting in on the inside, except the film tempted me to read the book on which it's based, and I found that the real gypsies are a lot rougher than they appear in this film. I wish the film had been rougher, I wanted to be scared, frightened of the gypsies, instead of feeling they're sort of nice people. Let me ask you a question I know yeah. the answer to. Did you like the Godfather you films? Bet, yeah. Didn't you think that that kind of romanticized the Mafia? They're oh, professional killers, too. Yeah, a little bit, except that there were some real heavy murders in that film. Uh, this stuff was more of rounded romantic stuff, I think. And I didn't really mind that. I kind of, Sterling Hayden, we haven't mentioned him as the old grandfather, some of the romance there. We mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. it's a, you're not saying you didn't like the film. No, 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 I did like it. I do recommend it. Well, our next picture does not take us to a foreign place. Unfortunately, it takes us to an all-too-familiar place. Our next film is a sequel of sorts, Force 10 from Navarone. The title refers to, of course, the very successful World War II adventure film, The Guns of Navarone, made in 1961. The new film is also set in the European theater of World War II. Robert Shaw and Edward Fox play two British commandos sent to Yugoslavia to kill a German agent. They join then with an American soldier, Harrison Ford, you remember him, the Star Wars space jockey, to blow up a Yugoslav bridge to keep the German army from crossing a strategic river. Our experts have been studying that bridge for weeks, and they say it'll blow. I don't know where you learned your job, but I'm talking about the best construction engineers in the business. Yes. Well, they're probably experts at building things, whereas I'm an expert at blowing them up. And you can take it from me that one will need a good eight hours to make a decent job of that bridge. Hours. Assuming, of course, that Jerry is kind enough to leave us in peace. And maybe provide a few working lights. Miller. You've seen those searchlights, have you? Yes, well, I should... Miller. Sir. I think you've made your technical point. Many thanks, sir. Well, if I weren't absolutely sure of my facts, sir, I wouldn't be telling you this now. And you do understand, sir, I'm not exaggerating. Miller, what would happen to the bridge if that central arch was suddenly hit by several million tons of water? 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 I think we've been talking about the wrong target. Remember that dam we passed just up around the yeah. bend? What kind of a dam? What is it? It's about two and a half miles up the river. But my dear chap, why didn't you say so before? Oh, I did a tremendous job at a dam. Good. See, with the dam, you've got your natural elements working for you. Yeah, it's like having an enormous bath. All you've got to do is pull the plug. Don't you get the feeling you've seen this movie before? You bet you have. This is a 50s war film if I've ever seen one. We get that old standby in an earlier scene in the picture, the one noble black American soldier. And we get double agents conveniently turning up whenever the story bogs down and needs a twist. And most of all, there never is any real sense of danger here. This is an old-fashioned, soft, romantic war film. And after what this country has been through recently, we don't buy this kind of film anymore. Force 10 from Navarone is truly trivial. 
It is pretty strung out. I guess there might be a couple of things in it that we might talk about. It does contain a farewell performance by Robert Shaw, who died this year. Mm -hmm. Not one of his best performances, yeah. but it's a reminder of what he could do. Mm -hmm. And secondly, at the end, the special effects, the dam bursting, the bridge going over, you know, they're well done. I thought it was Yeah, the dam bursting, I tell you, it's better than the dam bursts in Superman, which we're going to talk about later in the picture. Well, I, we could debate that, but I'll say this much. If you're trapped in this movie, at least stay until the end, yeah. which is more than I can say for the next movie, with this <laughs> one, beginning, middle, or end, leave. It's a <laughs> shame, really, too, because it stars two of my favorite people, John Travolta and Lily Tomlin. And I like Travolta because of the tremendous energy and charm he brings to movies like Saturday Night Fever and Grease. And Tomlin, because of the amazing and sometimes almost scary perceptions in the gallery of American eccentrics that populates her nightclub act and TV appearances. So when I heard about their new film, Moment by Moment, I found myself really looking forward to it. It's the story of a love affair between a young California drifter and an older, rich, married woman. And the film promised to say something important about the ways we look at age and romance in this country, but unfortunately it's a total failure it's not just a bad film it's a disaster <laughs> it's an embarrassment it's a series of scenes that go nowhere and dialogue that sounds like people searching for something to say to each other and not finding it and just look at this scene for example when they when they meet outside tomlin's beach house Good morning just hope you had a good night's sleep just fine thank you can i borrow a towel from you you don't have a towel Forget it, I'll just let the sun dry me out. It's better for you anyway. Here, use this. Thank you. I would have brought my own towel, but uh, I was gonna get it from my, my friend's house, but guess what happened? Don't you wanna know what happened? Okay, what? They weren't there. Last night I had to sleep on the beach with no blanket or nothing. Some friends, huh? Are, are you finished with that chicken? Yes. Are, are you gonna give it to Scamp or throw it away or what? Would you like some? Oh, yes. Thank you. Scamp. Is that one? Thank you. Here, Scamp. No, don't feed him. No? Okay. Sorry, Scamp. The thing is, most of my friends are undependable. Except for Greg, and Greg is in, in jail now. I told you that. We gotta get him out. Do you uh, like to cook? I like to read. The kind of uneasy quality you sense between Travolta and Tomlin in that scene is typical of the whole movie. They're supposed to fall in love, but they never convince us that they even care about one another. Tomlin seems at times to almost be retreating into one of her comic characters, and Travolta, who plays most of the movie in his underwear, <laughs> sometimes hardly seems to be paying any attention to her at all. There are other problems, too, like not one, but two dumb scenes in which Tomlin searches all over Los Angeles for Travolta after he runs away. They say good actors can save a bad movie, but apparently nothing could save this one. You're absolutely right. I'm as big a John Travolta fan as there is, and yet uh, he's awful in this film because of the words that are put in his mouth. I don't think he cares for Lily Tomlin in this picture, not in the remotest sense. And the fault is the script, absolutely. The, the fault might be partially the script and partially the direction. They're both the fault, shall we say, of the same person, Jane Wagner, who was also Tomlin's manager. So she was kind of in charge of the whole project. If another director had come in and looked at this screenplay, I think it would have been immediately obvious that it needed lots more work before they should ever begin to put it in front of a camera. No, it's true. It's laughable at times. And it's a big disappointment, as you mentioned, because those are two big stars. Now, uh, our next film, uh, we, we had high expectations for it as well. And the big question, of course, with the movie Superman is, does it live up to its huge promotional and advertising campaign? Well, it had better because I think the public is wising up to the fact that the bigger the advanced promotional hype on a film, the worse that film probably is. Well, a pleasant surprise this time. Superman is very entertaining. Kids should love it, even though it runs nearly two and a half hours. 
Now, the big surprise is that the film's love story, and not the much talked about flying scenes, that's what makes Superman a hit. The movie begins on the planet Krypton as Superman's father, Marlon Brando, says goodbye to his baby son. Krypton's about to blow up and the baby is about to be sent to Earth. You will travel far, my little Kalel. But we will never leave you, even in the face of our death. The richness of our lives shall be yours. All that I have, all that I've learned, everything I feel, all this and more, I, I bequeath you, my son. Brando was paid nearly $4 million for his brief role in the picture. He's almost worth it. He makes the fantasy, I think, believable. Now, later in the picture, when that little baby gets to Earth, of course, Superman adopts the guise of Clark Kent, mild-mannered, you know what, for a great metropolitan <laughs> newspaper, The Daily Planet. Christopher Reeve, until now an unknown off-Broadway actor, plays the bumbling Clark Kent to a T. Here he is on his first day at The Daily Planet with editor Jackie Cooper and Margot Kidder as reporter Lois Lane. Lois Lane, say hello to Clark Kent. Hold you one, Pete. Oh, Hi, Lois Lane. Hi, Remember my dynamite expose on the sex and drug orgies in the senior citizens' home? Remember the... How you doing? Jimmy Olsen, photographer. Oh, hi. Clark Kent, nice to meet you. Coming and going. He's got everything. He's got sex, he's got violence, he's got the ethnic angle. I mean, look at Yeah, so is a lady wrestler with a foreign accent. Ken, can you open this? Oh, sure, Mr. White. This could be the basis for a whole series of articles. Making sense of senseless killings by Lois Lane. I mean, we get psychologists, we get sociologists, we get... Lois, Lois you're pushing a bunch of rinky-dink tabloid garbage. The Daily Planet has a condition. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to shake it up like that. Oh, well, of course not, Lois. I mean, why would anyone want to make a total stranger look like a fool? I'll take that. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Wayne. Olson, why am I paying you $40 a week when I should have you arrested for loitering? Go get Mr. Kent. No, it's Move, kid. Move. Right, right, Chief. And make mine black and no sugar. Right, Chief. And don't call me sugar. Blood is in the metropolis. Right, Chief. Sugar. sugar. Chief, Chief wants coffee, no sugar. Coffee. Take the tea with lemon. Uh, Lois, why don't you take Kent out to uh, meet everybody, huh? Sure. Just introduce him around. He's starting with a paper today. I'm giving him the city beat. Chief! That's my beat. Lois, Clark Kent may seem like just a mild-mannered reporter, but listen, not only does he know how to treat his editor-in-chief with the proper respect, not only does he have a snappy, punchy prose style, but he is, in my 40 years in this business, the fastest typist I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. Probably wears out a few typewriters along the way, too. The biggest change in the movie from the old 50s Superman TV show is that in this new film, Superman really digs Lois Lane. They both have a big crush on each other. And we see it here in the film's very best scene when Lois interviews Superman for the first time. He gives her a hilarious exclusive interview at her rooftop apartment. Now, just watch Christopher Reeve here. He's so good, he makes you forget he's wearing a ridiculous red, yellow, and blue suit with a cape yet. How tall are you? Uh, about 6'4". And uh, how much do you weigh? Mm, around two, two twenty-five. Two, two twenty-five. Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, I assume then that the the rest of your bodily functions are normal. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Well, putting it delicately. Mm-hmm. Do you eat? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I do. When I'm hungry. You do? Of course you do. <laughs> well, well then, uh, is it true that uh, you can see through anything? Uh, yes, I can. Oh, well, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that you're um, totally impervious to pain? Well, so far. What color underwear am I wearing? Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I embarrassed you, didn't I? Oh, no. I did. No, 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 not at all, Miss Lane. It's just that this platter must be made of lead. Uh, yes, it is, so? Oh, you see, I, uh, I sort of have a problem seeing through lead. Oh, that's interesting. Problems and thirst. Hmm. 
Uh, d uh, do you have a first name? What do you mean, like uh, Ralph or something? No, no, I mean like... Uh, Pink. Huh? Pink. A wonderful, charming scene. Now, the last 40 minutes of the film, though, is a juvenile crime story with Gene Hackman playing a soft criminal trying to blow up California. He's a namby-pamby sort of villain we used to see on that old Batman TV show. But, ah, the love story. That's what makes Superman really worth seeing. Ah, the love story, indeed. I knew the love story was coming. I thought the special effects were great. What surprised me was, look at it this way, this movie has been coming for six years. Mm -hmm. It's been announced a hundred times. It cost $60 million, $40 million, a couple of million dollars one way or the other. A lot of money. I expected that with that kind of money, they would be very solemn in their approach toward the money they spent, toward mm -hmm. the special effects. I was surprised that it had a sense of humor. The thing that surprised me about the movie is that among every, along with everything else, it's one of the year's most refreshing comedies. I'll challenge you, though, on one point, and that's the special effects. As far as the flying special effects are concerned, I thought they were fine. You can't see any wires. <laughs> but some of the special effects that uh, weren't involving the flying, like a dam bursting was an obvious model. There's a plane that falls out of the sky. What about when Superman is holding up the Earth's crust, for example, during that's good. It stops the earthquake? That's it's a good one. Bad, no? But there's a helicopter shot that looks cheap. And uh, there are many other things. I think they spent so much time on the, the getting the flying right that they let some of the other now, stuff go. I really go. don't think we've made the movie sound too boring. He's no. holding up the Earth's crush, airplanes <laughs> are flying out of the sky, dams are bursting, the California no. coast slides into the sea. It's really a pretty entertaining picture. It's a lot of fun, but uh, I'll go back to the human terms and specifically the performance of Christopher Reeve. This guy is a natural light comedian. He's just as good as Clark Kent as he is as Superman. He's really an actor to watch. And if the, if the role had been cast in the wrong way, they would have been in big trouble. He pulls it off. They had a national talent search for once they found the right talent. I agree. Now, this is usually the point in the show when Spot, the wonder dog, who can smell a bad film at 50 paces, <laughs> normally trots into our balcony here for the Dog of the Week feature. But we gave Spot the day off so we could spend more time with Superman and the rest of the holiday movies. Spot is probably at home right now chewing on his Christmas stocking. Lucky yeah. him. So anyway, how did the Hollywood blockbusters measure up? We agree that Oliver's story, which is rated PG, is mostly flat and lifeless, and we can't recommend you go to see it. That's why there's a no under both our names. We sure didn't like moment by moment either. John Travolta and Lily Tomlin were shipwrecked by a hopeless script and bad direction. We liked King of the Gypsies, though, and we both recommend this inside look at three generations of a colorful and violent American gypsy family. Neither one of us can recommend Force 10 from Navarone. Gene thought it was totally silly, but I gave it credit for some good action scenes toward the end. And finally, we were both really enthusiastic about the sensational epic Superman. We went into the theater with our doubts and came out as believers. I did even more so than Gene, so two big yeses for the Man of Steel. That's it for this week's show. Next on Sneak Preview, still more new holiday movies, including California Suite, the Neil Simon comedy about five couples staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Also, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, a remake of the 1956 science fiction classic. And Every Which Way But Loose, with Clint Eastwood playing a professional and funny barroom brawler. Until then, from Roger and me, season screenings, everyone. <laughs> Have a nice holiday. <laughs>